worked with Colin quite a bit. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to talk about something a little different than what we've been talking about. A lot of our uh, WRP properties um, and state wildlife areas, uh, private properties on the river, we have a lot of really good wetland habitat. A lot of really awesome moist soil management units. We're learning how to manage those, how to maximize those for duck benefit. But a lot of times those are two acres, five acres, 10 acres, 15 acres on properties that might be 200 acres or 300 acres in size. So that leaves us a whole lot of land out there um, that is left to manage. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit and we're gonna talk about the intersection of wetlands and upland wildlife. I found this picture and I just love it. It's about the best thing since sliced bread. At least Colin chuckled, thank you. So, where we're we gonna go, a little bit. Um, like I said, we're gonna talk about something a little different, riparian wildlife, and specifically, um, we're gonna talk about a suite of upland birds um, that are either very dependent on or are occurring in our riparian areas. So bobwhite quail in this neck of the wood, they gotta be down on the South Platte River bottoms, that's just where they're gonna exist, if anywhere. We're going to talk a little bit about turkeys. Um, they have a little bit more uh, generalized um, habitat requirements, but again, very tied to our river bottoms. And I threw in the pheasant there. Everything that I'm going to talk about can apply to pheasants, uh, but they are much, much more of our traditional upland bird species. So just keep in the back of the mind that this is kind of going to be the upland bird talk, but we're really focusing kind of on quails and then to a bit uh, of an extent turkeys. It's mostly just because turkeys are the awesomest bird ever in the history of birds. All right, so let's talk about some guiding principles of management before we get too into this. Um, we've touched on a few things, but the first concept before we talk about any kind of wildlife management that we have to understand is that of ecological succession. We've talked about that in the you know, pond basin context already this morning. Um, when we're talking about our riparian areas or uplands, we have a pretty defined uh, set of plant community responses that come in. So over time, time goes uphill apparently. So over time, what do we have first coming in after some bare ground? Say a fire on first, I've got some bare ground there. I heard something over here. Weeds. Weeds, annuals. Thank you, Steven. He'll belt it out for me. So you got your annual weeds. They kind of look like lollipops. Uh, when I draw them. So, annual weeds, here's a sunflower, I like those. What goes in next? Wow. I know that there's some professionals in this room. Anyone know what comes next? Thistle. Thistle! <laughs> Thank you. Then you get, because we're in my curry bottoms, right? That's a totally valid point. You get your Canada thistle. It's got the little tufts on top. Right, so you start getting, what, you start getting your annual grasses and you start moving into some perennial forms. So we get, you know, some annual grasses here. Look, it's horrible, it's on the river, it's cheap grass. Um, and you start getting perennial forms moving in. What comes in next? Perennial grass. Perennial grass. Finally, the habitat biologist talks. All right, we start getting some awesome, awesome perennial grass. You know it's awesome because it's big, it has this growth form. Over time, we got perennial grass, what starts coming in after that? I heard it. Shr shrubs, I think. Oh my gosh, this is so scary. Yeah, we start getting shrubs, right? I don't know how to draw a good shrub. It's not a tree, it's a big shrub. And then lastly, we get things like our cottonwoods and our crack willows and our tree species, right? Does that make sense to everybody? I know you've been having the coffee and the donuts, so it should be kicking in a little bit. So we just went through that exercise, and why do we care? You have to determine what kind of wildlife you want, and then you have to understand how your plant community is gonna change through time so that you can manage for that species. Pretty basic concept. So one thing that you know I see on some properties is um, you know, and I'll use our WRP easements as one because, you know, I can make fun of the NRCS since I work for it. There's a lot of times, you know, we'll do a conservation easement with a landowner and then we just, we walk away from it. We tell them, ah, you can't graze it, you can't have any fun on it, you can't ever look at it again, just leave it alone. Well, that's a really, really good way um, to have what we call non-management, which is still a form of management. 
what we kind of end up doing is actively managing pretty much against everything we would ever want to occur on that site because our management decision is to leave it alone. We're just letting this run its course till we get a whole bunch of trees and there's so many shrubs and there's no grass growing, there's not a forb on it. Okay? So we need to understand what our target species are, how the plant communities change over time, um, and understand how those interact. What do we want to manage for? All right? One other concept that I'm going to throw out here um, is the concept of managing for populations versus concentrating animals. Um, I don't know, anybody kind of know what I'm getting at with that? There's two kind of different thoughts of management. One is, you know, I really want to grow some more quail on my river bottom so that we have more quail in the area. I want more numbers. I want to see hundreds of quail. The other concept is, well, I know that there's five quail here, and I'm not going to address any limiting factors for them, but I'm going to plant something that they're going to want to eat so I have five quail and I see them every day on my back window. That makes sense? Instead of supporting populations, we're concentrating animals so that we can see them. And there's nothing wrong with that. For a hunting opportunity, that's a really important thing to do. A lot of the practices that we talk about with management basins, um, ha, see, you got it. You understood why I wanted the light on. So uh, a lot of what we talk about is a way to support populations and provide recreational opportunity. But they are two different concepts that we need to understand as we go through this stuff. So those are our guiding principles. And uh, with that, we're going to kind of jump into a little bit more of the specifics. And again, thinking mostly about the upland birds that are going to be occurring on these river bottom properties. So thinking about these little guys, they're totally awesome and cute. They have a fairly... Um, similar set of habitat needs. So for a lot of these guys, when we look at what our limiting habitat, habitat types often are on the river, we're looking at nesting habitats, broodering habitats, and security cover. You know, how much of those are lacking really depends on the species. Security cover really isn't a big deal for turkeys on the South Platte, whereas for quail, it's a major issue, and we need to be talking about that on a lot of properties. Um, so. A little bit of difference, but those are really what you need to think about. <coughs> Most times, I'm going to say typically, food is not limiting. We've got enough crops out there um, that, you know, there's enough waste grain uh, to get these birds through, uh, through a winter. Again, when we get to quail, um, because they have such small home, home uh, ranges, you can make an argument that sometimes they need some uh, work on food resources. But this is kind of the big picture, what to be thinking about when we're thinking about upland birds in these river bottoms. Okay. So we're going to talk about the first one, nesting habitat. Do we have a remote clicker? Will this click remotely? Yeah. I like to wander. I keep having to come back. All right. So nesting habitat for things like quail and turkeys and pheasants. We have a suite of grasses that biologists love. They are called warm season bunch grasses. Thank you, Jerry. All right. Warm season bunch grasses is really what you need to be thinking of when you think of nesting habitat for these little guys, right? So grasses like switchgrass. You are going to hear biologists and land managers talk about switchgrass until you're blue in the face, and we're blue in the face. Why do we love switchgrass? It's a bunch grass. It gets really tall. Because it's a bunch grass and it's really, really thick, it provides horizontal cover. So things, you know, like foxes and skunks and whatnot that are running along the ground. They can't really see through it if it's dense. And it also provides canopy cover from those arching leaves. So it's providing aerial cover from things like owls and raptors, okay? We love this stuff so much that you're gonna have to forgive us. Sometimes if we see a really good stand of it, we will hug it. Please forgive us and move on, all right? So some other species of grass out there, little blue stem, another uh, one that you'll see especially as we move more into uh, some of the kind of like the uh, CRP stuff around. Yellow Indian grass, another really good one. Uh, big blue stem and sand blue stem. And just a note on propagating um, big blue stem, some of these species, um, you can't just throw the seed out and walk away. So always, always make sure to high five your big blue stem whenever you plant it. Sorry, I saw that when I was sort of Googling images and it just, that's how my head works at 11 o'clock at night. All right, when we talk about turkeys, I'm going to throw out one more thing, um, down wood. It's important for turkeys, especially in areas where you don't have really good tall grass uh, cover for nesting. Um, I'm working on a project down in the Republican Basin right now and 
Um, we're doing a lot of brush and olive removal, and we have a contractor that gets a little bit giddy about picking up down cottonwood logs. And I was taken to task last week by uh, someone with a sheep on his uh, shirt saying, well, you know, you're picking up all that turkey nesting habitat. I know, we're trying not to. But so down wood, think those big logs. Turkeys love to get behind that and uh, make little nests. So switching over to broodering habitat. Um, you know, really since about, I don't know, the 90s maybe, uh, folks have been talking about broodering habitat for upland birds. And it's just kind of, you know, something you, you think about. Well, I was going back and uh, reading some descriptions of limiting factors uh, for <coughs> Greater chickens, um, and lesser chickens from 1978. It was an old DOW publication. And first thing said, well, we think rootering out of that probably a really major limiting factor. So, wow, there is nothing new under the sun. We've been talking about this for a long time. But why do we care about rootering out of that besides the fact that it's limiting? I guess, what is it? Horns in the Horns in the background. Thank you. Horns full of insects. Horns full of insects, exactly. So, if you are a little chick quail, and you're absolutely tiny, or a little chick turkey, and you're just slightly less tiny, you have a long way to go to put on a lot of feathers and a lot of bones in an incredibly short period of time. We're talking four to six weeks, right? So that means you need to be consuming mass, mass, mass amounts of protein, or you're not going to make it. You're going to end up as food for something else. So we need forbs, those weedy areas that provide all those insects. It's the same sort of concept we were talking about in the pond bottoms, where we need plants that provide invertebrate resources for ducks. This is the same thing just up on the riverbank right there. So we need those weedy areas that are generating insects that those birds can get into and pick out those bugs. Because they are so little, and especially, especially for quail, um, we need a lot of dirt around. They're just, they're itty bitty. You saw the picture of Colin in the smartweed? Was it fun walking through that smartweed? You kind of have to push your way through it. Well, I love smartweed, so... <laughs> so, I mean, you had to push your way <laughs> through, great. but it was okay. If you're a little itty-bitty chick, think about what just some smooth brome grass is. It's that same concept. They're so little, they can't push their way through that. They need that bare ground to be able to run freely. Um, even adult quail, they're not a big critter. They need bare ground to be able to run freely. So, that's why you're, you'll hear biologists harp and harp and harp on bare ground. All right. Looking at the security cover issue, again, I said, um, you know, this really comes to mind when we talk about um, bobwhite quail because they are very much tied to brush. Um, there's a few different kinds of shrubs that are growing out on the river that provide really good um, escape security cover, um, severe winter cover. Uh, so a lot of it is our willows that are out there. Those willow thickets can be really good for bobs. Um, snowberry is really good, just kind of uh, escape cover from predators. Um, it can do okay in, uh, in smaller storms. If you can get uh, the willow overtopped with uh, Phragmites, that's really good severe winter cover uh, for Bob White. Um, some sumacs that are out there. So really what we're looking for is dense shrub cover. <coughs> and we kind of have our ideas, our ideas in our heads of, well, you need one giant cubby headquarters. And if you have one giant cubby headquarters on your place, you will have it's all the quail that you need, you know? Yeah, it's easy to hunt. Yeah, there will be quail there. But quail really need shrubs that are spread out in patchy um, distribution across a whole property. Um, you know, they're going to run through grass, but they really need that shrub for security cover. Um, so you're not just looking at one giant cubby headquarters. You're looking at how do I get sporadic patches of these shrubs throughout a property. Okay? And that kind of brings me to kind of the last habitat factor I want to talk about, which is interspersion. Um, this is just, again, using a, a quail example in Trent Star. Sorry I stole your uh, picture. <laughs> um, so just to show you kind of what, what a quail needs and in what proportion, quail home range is maybe 20 to 40 acres. Uh, maybe a little bit bigger right now down on the river just because we can't have shrubs being a limiting factor. Um, you know, in a perfect world, we'd have about half annual weeds, bare ground, kind of open feeding areas, about 20% shrubby, uh, brushy cover for security, and then about 30% warm season grass, which would be our nesting clumps, right? And we need that over that 20 to 40 acre home range. We need all of that in 20 to 40 acres. That's take some thought about how to produce that on the ground, because that's a lot of interspersion of habitats. So we start looking at a stretch of river, 
and we start thinking about individual blocks. Okay, how do I get all of those habitat factors in this block? How do I get them in this block? Uh, and again, thinking, how do we get that interspersion? Okay. Um, let me see where I'm at here. So, I guess any any questions on kind of those habitat factors? Excellent, excellent. Silence is what I like to hear. So, talking about the tools that we have available for managing river bottoms, this is going to be like not even the thirty thousand foot level talk. This is Colin basically gave me twenty minutes to cover, you know, what could easily be a lifetime's worth of work. So I'm going to just talk real, real briefly about what some of the tools are and focus in on one of them that I think is probably the most relevant to a lot of properties. Um, so uh, the traditional tools that managers use for managing um, uplands and these river bottom properties, we have the axe. You're going to notice a little rhyme. If any of you have read Leopold, this is going to come back. The cow, fire, and the plow. I know there's no plow, but that was just such an awesome picture. I, I couldn't help myself. Isn't it though? Isn't it? <laughs> so those are, those are our main tools. We have some other tools, herbicide use, planting, but those are really our main tools when we talk about managing properties. So the one that I'm going to concentrate on is the funny looking guy with the tongue, the tongue sticking out there, the cow. Um, livestock grazing, especially when we're talking about hundreds of acres at a time, is really one of the most cost effective management tools that we have. Um, it's something that does need to be very much um, thought out and understood what we're doing with cattle. But in terms of, um, you know, maybe paying someone to come and burn your place, and I know for folks with the sheep on their shirt, I don't think you can even burn right now on state properties. Um, there's a lot of, you know, hard times with uh, using fire. It's pretty easy to find somebody with cows and hopefully we'll play ball with you on the grazing plan that you want. So, talking about cattle grazing. Um, Really, I see two fairly common extremes uh, when it comes to South Platte properties. One is what I described before, that non-use. Uh, we get a lot of our WRP easements where we've come in, we've said, thou shalt not ever put a cow on here again, and then we left it alone for 10 or 15 years. Well, what happens? We get a lot of plant growth over time. That litter on the ground builds up. It starts to choke out the grasses. Um, we get a whole bunch of shrub maybe coming in, maybe too much shrub to the point that we're excluding the grasses that we want. So we have this one extreme of non-use that's out there, which is not desirable for the species that we want. We're managing against those quail. Um, like I said, turkeys will show up in a lot of places, but they'll start using those areas less and less. Um, the other extreme is overgrazing. And overgrazing can be kind of a loaded term. I'm going to call it undermanaged. Um, you can use a lot of head of cattle very effectively if you manage them property, properly. Um, but what we see a lot of times is that overgrazing or that undermanaged where you have way too much bare ground. Um, you might have way too many weeds and they're the wrong kind of weeds. They're your can of the thistle and spurge and stuff they really don't want coming in. Um, and you've lost your grasses, you've lost your shrubs, so you've got that other end of the extreme. So the trick is, okay, how do we use cattle in a way um, that are going to get us to where we want to go? So we know that we want warm season grasses out there. We know that those used to occur naturally on the South Platte. We know we have a lot of cool season grasses out there right now. We got a lot of smooth brome. Uh, we've got a lot of cheat grass. But we can use cows to actively promote those warm season grasses and see if we can start bringing them back. It's a long way to go, but we can do it. So how do we, how do we start promoting warm seasons through grazing? And Stephen, you can't answer this one because you're doing it on our WRPs right now. So, <laughs> hard, get, it, get it hard and early. Get it hard and early. Start an early heavy grazing to suppress your cool seasons, particularly your cheap grasses. Mm -hmm. Get off of it in early summer and allow your warm seasons to propagate. I couldn't have said it better myself. I would never have come up with a big word like propagate. Right. But that's exactly what it is. You want to get in there. You know, especially, exactly, brome cheatgrass, it's greening up in March, hit it hard, you want to damage those plants, but then you want to get off there as quickly as possible and let that stuff alone through the summer um, so that your switchgrass and you know, yellow Indian, your blue stems can have that recovery period um, and can get growing. Um, and if you look at um, trying to work that into a grazing plan, 
a lot of operators, they need some place to go in summer. So there might you know, have to be some concessions with getting into different pastures and setting up a rotation system. But that's the main concept that you want. Let's reduce the cool seasons by hitting them really, really hard, and then let's get off it and stay off it. Okay. So another concept that I want to throw out there, it's kind of along the, uh, the same lines. Um, you know, we talked about forbs and bare ground for brood rearing. Well, okay, how do I get forbs and bare ground? We know, right, that forbs and bare ground is way down on this end. But we still want some grasses. We don't want to get rid of all our grasses. So forbs and bare ground, all right, so we need some grazing. So same sort of concept. We want to come in really, really hard, physically create that bare ground with trampling, um, working that litter back into the ground with that hoof action. That disturbance is going to promote a flush of weeds. You get that bare ground for maybe you know, a year or two. Um, and then it's going to start moving back into that grass phase. So you get those areas just temporarily. So if you rotate that over time, so say you set up some small pastures and you come in, you come in hard to maybe just a third of uh, your pastures one year, let that sit for two years. Well, you had some really good stuff in there for you know, year one, two, and three, and that year four you come back and you hit it again. So you can rotate that disturbance so that you're not totally losing all your grasses and your shrubs and the stuff that you want, but you're just hitting that stuff just enough to move it back on the succession scale. That makes sense? Nobody wants to throw rocks on me yet? Okay, we, we can go with that. Um, so the last concept I'm gonna throw out because we do have shrubs. Um, if you can come in on a rotation system or kind of talking about you know, every few years, every third year, every fourth year, your shrubs are generally going to be okay. Just the thing to be mindful of is, you know, a lot of our willows and our shrubs, they're really getting into their heavy growth periods kind of later summer. Um, so you want to make sure that, you know, if you've got a property and you're trying to manage for shrubs, you're not always having cattle in there at the end of July, early August, eating those shrubs. Because that's how shrubs just get grazed out entirely um, and just get removed from a property. So you always just want to have in mind, okay, let's make sure we're doing good things, but just be aware we don't always want to be hitting the shrubs at the same time. And again, rotation system or having something where you give it a couple years rest, those shrubs will be just fine. Um, and again, I guess the last kind of thought I want to throw out is this stuff needs to be on a scale of hours. Um, if you're looking at quail, you're looking at really, really small, you know, small scale sorts of things, 20 acres, 40 acres, 80 acres, something like that, trying to get this interspersion of habitats. For turkeys, maybe you're thinking, well, you know, I'm a turkey freak, so I'm just gonna you know, try to set up this 500 acre property in a really good rotation system. I'm gonna work on suppressing my cool seasons over time, promoting some shrubs, but turkeys, they move around a ton. You can think a little bit bigger for them. Um, and like I said, in this river stuff, pheasants are just kinda gonna show up wherever. That's a whole nother discussion. Um, all right, that is my quick and dirty approach to river bottom management. A lot of these um, little upland birds, especially the quail, they're kind of an umbrella species, an indicator species. If you're seeing these guys show up, um, you're probably doing good things for a lot of other species that are out there. So if you've got, this is my plug for uh, NRCS and our biologist program, if you have a property and you would like to know more about grazing or wildlife management for upland species on river bottoms, I put my name up here just because I know my own phone number and my own contact information, but there's a few of us you can talk to. Um, myself and RCS, we work on private lands. Um, if you slip us a 50, we'd be happy to come out to an SWA and uh, give you our two cents. Uh, Colin, it's our WRP extraordinaire. He can answer these questions. Jerry Miller in the back um, is also working on this sort of stuff. So if you just want to, you know, want us to come out to your place, you just want to give a call and say, hey, what, are you, what do you think about this? Or what can you tell me about, you know, I don't know, jackalopes on my property in Logan County? Um, we'll tell you all you need to know about jackalope, jack, jackalope habitat. So again, um, visit with any one of us or go ahead and give me a call and I'll hook you up with the right person. So that being said, are there any final questions? Thanks for that highly caffeine charged upload presentation. That's why you paid 50 bucks. Just thought I'd give you 20 minutes. I, I keep ate a on cookie going. too. <laughs> um, to go along with uh, her, her talk on upland management, I think weed management is uh, another big issue on our uplands to maintain a healthy uh, uh, repairing flood, flood plains. And in the back, you should have got 
gotten two guide sheets, one on Canada Thistle, one on Leafy Spurge. And I put these together in conjunction with uh, CSU um, extension with uh, Bruce Bosley. And we developed these guidelines, we poured through about a dozen different publications and boiled it down to what, will, what we think will work best in the South Flat. Things that were very selective for the weeds that we want to treat, which is Kenneth Thistle and, and Leafy Spurge, um, and ones that would not affect the non-target species as much, especially plants like snowberry um, and warm season grasses. Let's quickly do a number on the cool season grasses as well. But uh, take a look at that, um, kind of some of our best management practices. I know Byron's got a lot of experience doing uh, these treatments as well. Um, and uh, I think he would have some other uh, information that contribute.